<laughs> and uh, it's true. So it was a quiet ride up today, literally, kind of like, I'm like, are you boys missing mom? The girls are like, yeah, dad. So I guess I, I, I'm not enough, rightfully so, to carry that, carry them. But uh, she flies in tonight. Midnight was the only flight she could get. So I'll be heading to IAH sometime in the middle of the night tonight. Uh, but just want to get her here. I don't like the idea of her going to LAX at 10 o'clock tonight, but I'll be praying for that. Um, also, uh, keep uh, praying for Abe and Sydney. They're back, continuing to spend time with Sydney's mom. If you don't know, she's uh, preparing to graduate to glory. Um, she's dying of stage four cancer and, you know, medically outside of a miracle. The Lord will be taking her home sometime this spring. And so they're going to go and um, spend more time this week with her, which will probably be the last time for the kids, at least, to be with them. So please pray for Diana. Um, and then also, I was at the halls home this week, went and saw them. You guys probably saw the prayer request. She is on bed rest, uh, I think, for um, uh, at least the next three or four weeks. And they're trying to uh, do all they can to develop the little one's uh, lungs with steroids and some other things. So I'm thanking the Lord for modern medicine in that way. Her spirits are good. They're encouraged. Um, I think a meal train is starting. Mark, is that right? Yeah, Beth, is. Beth, Mark, January? January 3rd. Yeah. January 3rd. If you'd like to bring them a meal, um, they, they would love that. They've been very encouraged by the outpouring of your love and care. I guess a lot of you have been reaching out. So thank you so much for that. Sweet to see the body of Christ work in that way. But please pray for them. Uh, it's hard with other little ones and uh, you, you know how that is as dads trying to navigate when, when they're the caregiver mostly. Mom is not as able, and you know how we do as dads, caring for the kids. It's powerful. Uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, what's that? Not. Powerful not. It's not very powerful. <laughs> so pray for them. Anything else we can pray for and put on the prayer list on your guys' hearts? Or do we have any visitors today for the first time? Looks like kind of the, the normal normal crew. Yes. My mom's here. Oh, we'd love to meet her. Yes. Betty and I were going to get baptized today and the baptistry's flooded, so we're not. Oh. We'll get it done. You could lay down. You could lay down in the leak. Yeah. Anyway, Janet Ham, she lives in Cape. Oh, Janet, so good to have you. Good to meet you. Well, we're thankful you're here again, and we'll get you a second time then. Yeah, yeah, exactly. For the the baptism. Wow, so the baptistry broke. (laughs) Wow. Well, it's not bad weather. We could go outside. There's some local ponds. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, well, sweet. It's good to have you. Well, um, let's open our time in prayer, and then we'll jump into our study today. Lord, we lift up Abe and Sydney in their ministry to her sweet, dear mother, who's served you in ministry for 30 years. Just comfort her, Lord, in the days ahead. Let her grandchildren be a sweet grace and encouragement to her in these final days on earth, and Fill her mind with thoughts of heaven and what it will be like to meet you, Lord, to sit with you, to fellowship with you. And we just ask that through the pain that she's going through, that you would comfort her with your words in John 17, even that you prayed, Lord Jesus, that we would come home and be with you. And she would anticipate that day. Be with Lee, her husband, as he prepares for the next season and pray that Abe and Sydney could just be sensitive and the other seven children on how they could minister to him. Lord, we pray for the Hall family. We're grateful um, in your mercy that, um, that the baby did not come this last week. And we, we know that ultimately you're the sustainer of life. You're the giver of life. You're the great physician. And yet we thank you for um, gifts of modern medicine and just uh, the wisdom we were able to have. And she was able to get to be able to uh, wait um, and be able to um, have good guidance on how to uh, go about the next weeks until the little one comes. And may our church family just be very sensitive to their needs and meet them with Christ-like love. And um, we are thankful for the for the hams. We're thankful for their baptism. We anticipate that day when they get to publicly de- declare 
to us what's internally taken place in their hearts and transformation. We, we love baptism because it represents the miracle of conversion. Thank you for this morning, this church. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, as far as our time this morning, I invite you to open your Bibles. I'm just going to begin with some introductory comments from Revelation 2 and 3. And we are going to get through... There it is. I heard it today. There. I, I hear it now. I hear it now. Um, we're going to get through just a little bit more on the characteristics of a biblical church. And um, I just want to introduce the idea of why we're having a study like this again to you. And then we're going to go to a little bit of a review of where we've been. And then I'll jump back into a few more comments on the internal calling of an elder. John Calvin, the great reformer of the Swiss portion of the Reformation, if you're familiar with the Reformation, there was a variety of different places it took place. John Calvin was instrumental in the Swiss portion, in particular, of setting apart what was a true church in contrast to the false Roman Catholic church. And one comment he said, I think is helpful for us as we think about our study on characteristics of the biblical church. And John Calvin said this, it's a simple comment, but it's, it's in line with all that the Lord has to say about his church. Calvin said, the excellence of the church or the excellence of a church does not consist in multitude, but in purity. Let me read that again. The excellence of a church does not consist in its multitude, the idea of how many people are there. But it, what, what makes up a church being excellent to Christ is this, that it has purity. That is, he's not just saying purity in its people, though that's true. It's to be purity in the people, but purity in doctrine. So what makes up a healthy church and what matters to the Lord is the church is pure and right and holy, both in doctrine and in practice. People are to understand the pure doctrine about the church, and people are to practice purity in their lives, not only in, in, a, in the, the truths that they believe and know about his people and about the Christian life, but in all of their practice as they apply his word. And I bring that up about the purity of the church because we need to remember that Jesus himself, when he takes an inventory, an audit, when he walks among his church in Revelation 2 and 3, just by introduction, the church matters to Jesus. Revelation 2 and 3 is the Lord Jesus is, is portrayed here, speaking to the seemingly the, the, the main elder, the leader, the messenger that leads that church, and he's talking about what he was assessing as he walked among his people. And what really matters about a church, and if it's a true church, is not what the culture says about it, not how many numbers you have, not that a sign is there. But if Jesus walks among his people and he took an assessment, would he say this is a true church? This is a real church. It doesn't matter who we are in contrast to other churches. What matters is if Jesus shows up, would he say, yes, this is a people that reflect me. And we need to remember that five of the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, Jesus severely warned. In Ephesus, if you just want to look there, he rebukes them for leaving the love they had at first. Uh, to go back to Calvin's comment, they left the purity of love. And Jesus says to them, if you don't repent and go back to being a church the way I say a church should function, namely with your love, Jesus says to the church in Ephesus, I'm leaving the membership role. I'm removing your lampstand. You can all still gather, but I'm no longer attending. The church matters to Jesus, not only um, in terms of, of its basic function, but it matters to Jesus how loving the people are to determine whether it's a real church and a faithful church, one that he's going to attend. To Pergamum, <clears throat> Jesus says, going down to 2.16, and prior to that, you've allowed impure doctrine and practice to enter the church. It matters to Jesus that we have a pure right doctrine. The pulpit matters to Jesus. The clarity of the text matters to Jesus. Discipleship matters to Jesus. Shepherding matters to Jesus. How we handle his word matters to Jesus. And then how we practice purity matters to Jesus. What's he saying in 2.16? Therefore repent or else I'm coming quickly. And I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. Those that are contributing to the impurity of the church in Pergamum, those that are partaking in it, Jesus says, I'm coming and I'm making war. I'm coming for you. You think about 
the Lord Jesus' hand being triggered, and it gets triggered very often in the scriptures for improper worship. To Thyatira, you go down to 22 and 23. They let impurity and worldliness come into the church. They invited the culture into the church. They invited the sinful practices into the church. This is when you know a man and a leadership team are not real faithful elders when they invite the world into the church and allow their people to be seduced by worldliness with worldly practices and call that church life. Jesus says, it matters to me that you stay set apart in your worship and your holiness. Look at 22 and 23. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into the great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. Unless there's repentance from impure practices and impurity in worship, Jesus says, I'm coming. And I'm coming to bring retribution. And remember, each of these comments in Revelation 2 and 3, they're corporate. So Jesus is addressing the leader and he's saying it to all of the church. This is a call for corporate worship in a church to repent. To Sardis, in chapter 3, verses 2 and 3, you remember their devotion to him became lifeless. Look at three, two and three. Jesus says, wake up and strengthen that which remains, which were about to die. For I have found your deeds and I have not found your deeds completed in the sight of my God. Verse three. So remember what you have received and heard and keep it and repent. Therefore, if you do not wake up. Wake up from what? Wake up from indifference. Wake up from laziness in church life. Wake up from coldness in church life. Wake up from not bringing real gospel biblical light. If you do not wake up and step into the light, I will come like a thief and you will not know what hour, but I will come to you. The church matters to Jesus. It matters how we conduct ourselves in church, even the life and body life. What is it that makes up vibrant body life? That was no longer in Sardis. And then Laodicea, down to 316. You know the church in Laodicea. They're neither hot nor cold. They had lost their vibrancy. They had lost their devotedness. Look at what Jesus says to them in 316. Because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Wow. Like, to get back to John Calvin's quote I started with, it matters to the Lord, not how many people are there. But the people that are there, that they function and they live and they believe what Jesus says we are to live, what we are to believe and how we are to conduct ourselves as a church. The church matters to Jesus. Why we're doing this study is because we want it to matter to us what matters to the Lord. Said another way, might even think of it this way. When you look at the scriptures, the volume is very loud. When Jesus talks about how much the church matters to him and how it's to conduct himself matters to him. We might say when the Lord talks about his church, he talks about it with contours and clarity and precision. How it's to function. Who's to lead? Who's not to lead? What are the people to look like? What are they not to look like? What's body life to look like? What is not to look like? What is unity? What is false unity? What is real preaching? What is false preaching? What is real leadership? What is false leadership? What is biblical love? What is a lack of love? What is biblical communication? What is biblically resolving conflict in the church? What are the one another's? There's 70 of them. It matters to the Lord how we conduct ourselves. That's very loud in the scripture. And yet, I think what concerns me a lot of the time, and I know many of you, is in the modern American church, while that's loud in the scriptures, it's like they're always trying to turn the volume down about what makes a real church distinct. It's, it's as if every other major area of doctrine, soteriology, the doctrine of salvation, we need to get that right. Sanctification, the doctrine of sanctification, we need to get that right. You know, pneumatology, the doctrine of the spirit, we need to get that right. Demonology, angelology, fill in the blank. And then this, this thing, ecclesiology, the church, it's like, Ooh. yeah, you can kind of do whatever you want there. You can kind of conduct yourself how you want. Oh, yeah, who leads, leads, that's okay. Who's excited can be a part of it. We'll put up a sign. We'll put up some advertisement. We'll have some people. We'll call it a church. That is not the message of scripture. Scripture has a lot to say about what a church is, what it's to do, and how it's to function. And so if you remember in our series, because of that, we've been studying in preparation for our launch a biblical church, characteristics of it. You remember we studied the Great Commission, the Great Mission, which is church planting, church strengthening. 
We studied why Jesus loves the church. If you remember, we looked at Matthew's gospel. Jesus first talks about membership in church discipline right in Matthew's gospel. Who's in and who's out. The authority given to leaders in the church. The authority given to the church. We saw in the book of Acts and the epistles, our Lord's heart for his people. How churches are formed, how they're established, and how they're to function. We started introducing that. And then we transitioned a few times ago about biblical shepherding and biblical eldership. You remember we talked quite a bit from Ephesians 4, 7 to 16, how called, qualified, gifted men are given to the church, which uh, is is the indication if those men are healthy that the rest of body life can be healthy. If you pull out healthy leadership, the church falls apart under it. And so we've been studying what is an elder. And I had five questions. I failed to mention them last time, but I'll give them to you again that I've been answering on characteristics of a biblical church as regard to elders. The questions I had were this. What is an elder? We covered that. And we're still covering it. Why do we need elders? We've been covering that and we're still covering it. And then we started getting into, it relates to the first two, how do we identify a real elder? And I've spent two times now talking about the internal calling of a real elder. So you've got external, we might say, his character, objective. And then we've got internally what God puts in the heart when he calls a man to be an elder. And that takes shape in the fruit in his life. And we can know that that internal calling is genuine by how it takes shape in his life and by his spoken desires. And then we're going to talk about in the coming weeks, if, the, if we know what an elder is and why we need them and how we identify them in the coming weeks after the new year, we're going to talk about what is their accountability and how are they raised up in a church? Because that is a question going back to Richard last week, Pastor Richard, when he says, we will be independent on our own at Cornerstone Bible Church, when there's qualified plurality of leadership. So you might be wondering, how does that take place? And I can't wait to talk about it. But as for today, I want to continue our sustained discussion here on how do we identify a real elder, a real shepherd, one called. And you remember, we were in Acts 20, 28. The Spirit appoints elders. God makes elders. I've been talking about that a lot, and we see that in the Scripture, right? And then we looked at 1 Timothy 3, 1, right? God gives a man a desire, a burden, this craving to be an elder. What I want to talk about just for the remainder of our time this morning is one thing I I haven't hit on as much. But I, I want to just kind of drill it home one last time so you understand my job description, any elder's job description, and help you really grasp what it is that God calls shepherds to be for his church in summary. So I just want to summarize what we've covered and drill it home. And I want you to see it in some passages again. So if God calls a shepherd to lead, right? To feed, to guide, to care for, to bring healing. We could summarize all of that up in this way. An elder is to be committed, convinced, laboring, um, exhausted for the sanctification of his people. The main thing an elder is to be concerned about is your holiness. The main thing an elder is to be burdened about is your personal purity, both in your heart that you're living before the Lord and in your conduct. An elder's job is your sanctification. Now, he can't control your sanctification. That's the Spirit's work. But he can use the means and the resources bringing the Word of God to you to help you grow in sanctification. I think sometimes today... Uh, And I've said this before, maybe you've heard me say it, but it's like an elder or a shepherd. We kind of put them on this, this spectrum of like, you know, you got like life coaches and you've got your gym trainer and you've got your continuing education people that instruct you. And you've got uh, uh, psychotherapists and psychologists and all these people. And and a pastor's kind of like all of them, just kind of there to help you in a variety of ways and Just, you know, string together quite a few things in your life so you kind of just exist with more comfort and more aid and you're encouraged. And certainly a pastor wants all of those things. But all of that is a wash if his main primary center of the target goal is not your sanctification, your holiness. A pastor's job is to be concerned about what the Lord Jesus is concerned about. What is the Lord Jesus most concerned about in your life? Your comfort, Um, you know, great job, great career, lots of money, pension, all those things can be fine. But what is the Lord Jesus most concerned about in your life? John 17, 17, Jesus prayed for you. What did he pray? 
sanctify them, set my people apart in their heart and in their actions in truth. My word is truth. When Jesus prayed for you to his father, he prayed you'd be holy. Jeremiah 23, 15. I've shown this to to you twice. I'll just state it again. The Lord says, when I give you shepherds, I'm going to give you them what? After what? My own heart. So shepherds after the heart of God or after the heart of Christ are concerned about what? People being sanctified in truth. This is why a pulpit that doesn't preach for sanctification is no real shepherding pulpit. A pulpit ought to be a place where the pastor is preaching for the sanctification of his people, for that fulfills the Lord's burden. Mark 9, 36. Do you remember Jesus looked out at the people? Remember the Lord Jesus. He looks out at the people and he's burdened as a shepherd that they were sheep that did not have shepherds. They were despondent and dispirited. They didn't have clarity how to grow in holiness. That burdens Jesus. When we think about the qualifications of an elder, and we think about the calling of an elder, when a man is called by God internally to be a shepherd, what God's placing in his heart is a desire to see his people holy. John MacArthur says this, I have about three quotes on this. Here's what he says about a pastor or an elder's job. And this goes back to the internal calling. When God burdens a man for ministry, he's burdening him to help people see them have fruit in their life. Now, all believers should want to do this. All of us should want to see other people have fruit in their life and grow and fulfill the one another's. But this is the all-consuming passion and concern of an elder, that his people are holy. John MacArthur says this, as a pastor... I understand my responsibility is not to the community. It's not to the culture. It's not to the people down the street. I'm not supposed to be entertaining them, clever enough to suck them in. I'm not going to redefine the church so that non-believers are happy and content. My responsibility is a very simple one. And it is to follow the great shepherd in the pursuit of the sanctification of his flock through his word. That's my mandate. And my reward will be based on my faithfulness to it and my lack of reward on my unfaithfulness. He says this, pastors are not called to the culture. We're not called to the unconverted. We have a mandate to feed our flocks so they grow spiritually. We're called to serve the redeemed people of God as an agent of sanctification and protection. The measure of a man's Ministry effectiveness is not the number of people in his congregation every week. It's the Christ likeness of his congregation. He later says the doctrine of sanctification defines our ministry. We are for the sanctification of God's people. Progressive, lifelong. It's why we do what we do. It's the pastor's work. It's the elder's work. That is why we are called. And this is a joy. This is a privilege for a pastor. It's a privilege to be thinking about the sanctification of his people. Let me show you this in a couple passages. Turn to Colossians 1. We're going to do quite a bit of coverage here in about 15 minutes of a number of passages. And I want you to see this on the page of the scripture. Don't just take my word for it or John MacArthur's word for it. Let's look at the text. Paul, giving his job description to the people in Colossae and the surrounding churches in the midst of all kinds of hirelings coming and trying to come into the church, Paul sets himself apart. And you know how Paul sets himself apart? Real elders are concerned about the sanctification of your people. All these other false teachers coming into account, they don't care about your holiness. They're saying don't taste, don't touch. They're all about externals, trying to conform you to some man-made standard. A real pastor is about giving you the truth so your heart is changed and your life is transformed by truth. Notice 28. We proclaim him. In the Greek text, it says, him we proclaim. So, yes, we preach Christ. I'm going to preach Christ. But preaching Christ is not just me saying, here's the atonement. Here's the gospel. If if I came up every week and just said to you, today we're going to be about Christ, and I'm just going to every week rinse, wash, repeat, and show you the glories of the atonement, I'm not a good shepherd. Because proclaiming Christ is both proclaiming His redemption, his accomplishments, his crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension. That's all part of it. But Paul says, I'm proclaiming Christ, but not just what Christ accomplished, but what Christ says to you and how it should change you. Notice, 
Him we proclaim, and then he modifies it. How am I proclaiming Christ? Admonishing every man. Literally, the idea is to take truth, put it in the mind, so people are changed. To, to take truth and plant it in their mind so it sticks, and it cements, and it galvanizes in their conscience, and they leave here with clarity on how to grow. A- admonishment would be this. Um, a shepherd elder is admonishing you not to hurt you, but to stick truth in your mind so you can apply that and become more holy. Nothing fills a pastor's heart more than you learning a truth, applying it that way, and being liberated from some area you've had weakness. And coming back the next week and say, Pastor, you wouldn't believe it. I heard the sermon, or I, I went out to eat with some, some godly men, or, or whatever, and I, and, I, and I heard the truth from God's word, and I took it this week, and I believed God's word, and I applied that truth, and all of a sudden, this lifelong pattern that was enslaving me, I've been liberated by truth, and my heart is full. I was admonished, and I got clarity, and now I'm growing. <clears throat> Admonishment is for the purpose of your health. Admonishment isn't to hurt and bring pain. Ultimately, it's to help. Notice, not just admonishment, but teaching. The consistent, steady, constant exposure to Scripture. Uh, If I could and you would let me, I would meet with you all seven days a week and I would just preach every night and we'd do small groups and we'd do discipleship and and that would not be good because it'd be in balance in your life. But the, the idea is indoctrination. A real elder, a real pastor, his job description is to indoctrinate you and that's not just teaching up here. See, my old pastor used to say this, it's one thing, Pastor Jerry Ragg, to preach a sermon to you and give you good content. But I'm not a shepherd yet. My job is after I've fed you a meal is to step down and then help you digest that. So it's not just teaching up here and then you never see me again or you never see godly elders again. It's teaching up here and then now you're in Acts 20 and it's house to house. It's life on life. That is teaching. Teaching and admonishing and from the pulpit, in the pew and house to house. This is body life. This is the instruction we're talking about. This is an elder's job description. Sometimes you'll hear about an elder or a pastor and it, it, it would be sad sometimes if you heard more about his life and if, if you asked him what he does between Sunday to Sunday and maybe a slot on Wednesday. And if you don't see people in those slots or times he's engaging people, house to house, discipleship, coffee shop to coffee shop, teaching the truth, you wonder if he's really fulfilling the mandate that's called here because it's teaching all the time. And listen, this is not... Just when they have energy or just when they feel encouraged. It's actually the point of exhaustion. Look at 29. For this purpose, I labor. That is the word for a farmer who is burdened in the field week in and week out until he sees fruit. Kopas. And you know the next word there? Striving. I'm going to give you the Greek word. Agonizomai. What's that sound like? Agonizing. So kopas, laboring for fruit agonizing it's these athletic these wrestling these fighting this 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 labor working up a spiritual sweat and then look he stacks up another word striving uh i labor excuse me i already said that word striving agonism and then he has another another word there um which uh according to his power which mightily works that's god working while i'm working that's labor intensive word groups god working in me while i'm working What am I laboring for, for fruit? What am I striving for, a pastor, an elder, a shepherd, agonizing, agonizing. according to his power? What am I mightily working as God works in me? For what? Go back to 28 now. Teaching, admonishing, and notice the sphere. With wisdom, helping people wisely apply the truth in a variety of circumstances. For what purpose? To make a better version of you? To give you your best life now? By the way, I drove by that church the other day. (laughs) <laughs> that, that so-called church to get to give you some to give you some version of yourself that makes you feel better about the, the version of you that you like to think about no so that we may present every man complete in christ you know what that word complete there is teleos it's the word to describe full maturity that means um the, the, literally, the word, when you take it to its end, it's to be at a place where you fully matured. And in this realm, in sanctification, it'd be the absence of sin. So guess when my job is done? Guess when an elder's job is done? When you have the absence of sin in your life. Guess when that happens? When you go to glory. <laughs> so guess when an elder's job is done? 
when he sends you off to the chief shepherd, (laughs) sanctified. And in the meantime, you're to be progressing in personal holiness. The word means to be mature, to be complete, to be growing. Look at it. Him we proclaim, admonishing, teaching with every man, with all wisdom, in the sphere of wisdom. Look, life is complicated. Life is difficult. Not every decision is black and white. Sometimes it takes a lot of prayer and a lot of time to think about the wise application of a truth in a certain context. An elder's job is to help people walk in wisdom. Where do you get wisdom? The scriptures. This is not like a, it's not, it's not like a ministry is built around whatever set of opinions, however many elders get together and they think is most wise. Wisdom comes from scripture. Principles come from scripture. These are men giving you truth. A pastor's job is your sanctification to walk in wisdom, to walk in truth. So that for the purpose, notice, that when he meets the chief shepherd, he can say, Lord, your people are more mature than when they came in and were under my care. Lord, this person came in and I, did, I labored and strived. It was your work to sanctify them, but I gave them the tools and the resources to do it and I can hand them back to you and they're bearing more fruit than they were by your mercy, by your grace, for your glory. Do you know that that concept of a congregation's holiness being reflective of a pastor's faithfulness is all through the scripture. Their fruit, their sanctification, their holiness before the Lord and as a reflection of a man's ministry is part of his passport for usefulness. MacArthur said it earlier that you measure a man's ministry not by the size of ministry but the sanctification of his people. Look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 3. I mean, this is amazing language. 2 Corinthians 3.1 Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need as some letter of commendation to you or from you? Look at this. You are our letter. You written on our hearts, known and read by all men. He's saying that to Corinth. When you are holy, Corinth, and this is, by the way, when most of Corinth is repented now. And this is his fourth letter to them. He's saying, my ministry, my heart, who I am as a man of God, who I am as a shepherd, it's reflected in not me writing a letter and telling everybody about you, but ultimately it is reflected by notice, you being the letter, being manifested, verse 3, that you are the letter of Christ. You look like Christ. You smell like Christ. You sound like Christ. When people are around you, they can tell you spend time with Christ. That is a reflection of my heart towards people. And that is a reflection of my ministry. You are our letter. If I am a faithful shepherd, Paul says, it is only known because you reflect Christ's likeness. And then that reflects back on me. You are the letter people can read about my effectiveness. Notice, look at it again. Three, you are the letter of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. The signs of the supernatural third person of the Trinity is all over your lives. And it's not on tablets of stones. It's on human hearts. Your transformation is my credibility. Paul says he's very concerned about that. Look at chapter 12. About your holiness, about your sanctification. A shepherd and elder is concerned about that. Notice 2 Corinthians, sorry, verse 11. Verse 1, I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness, but indeed you are bearing with me, for I am jealous for you. Here's the heart of a shepherd. Here's his burden. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband, that is Christ, that I might, notice, present you pure, holy. There it is, sanctified. But I am afraid. Want to know what keeps an elder up at night? Do you want to know what makes him afraid and keeps him on his knees? Here it is. That is the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, that your minds would be led astray from simplicity and purity and devotion to Jesus Christ. The internal calling that God puts on an elder's heart, on a man of God's heart, on a pastor's heart, is that his people would be holy. And notice, notice what, what's he concerned about? That their minds, that they'd have renovated minds and they'd not be led astray. Led astray from what? Simplicity and purity and devotion to Christ. There's a lot of things that can lead you away from simple devotion to Christ. Even good seeming things. A real elder is concerned about that. And do you want to know something? Go back to 1 Thessalonians 2. On the last day. This is one of my favorite passages in the whole New Testament by the way. 
On the last day, when an elder who gives care for a flock stands before the Lord, do you know what is going to be again his passport for ministry, his ministry effectiveness, his fruit before the Lord? When he stands before the Lord Jesus, what's going to fill his heart the most is not attendance numbers, is not how many building projects he did. It's not how big of an impact he made in the, uh, uh, the world of social media. What matters to him is that his people, when they meet their Lord, have become holy and set apart and sanctified. And they go before the presence of the Lord with holy lives, pure and set apart, saved by God and sanctified in his word. And for Paul to the Thessalonians, this holy, godly church, notice before you look at the end of two, look at down in verse two, verses 11 and 12. He says, just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each of you as a father would his children, so that you would walk in a manner worthy of the God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. He was concerned they'd keep walking in a manner worthy because look in chapter 1, they were already walking in a manner worthy. Notice chapter 1, verse 9 now. Verse 8, chapter 1, verse 8. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Look at this. That your faith toward God has gone forth so that we have nothing more to even exhort you you're living such holy lives. For they themselves, other people, verse 9, that were here about you, what a reception they had with you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living God. Thessalonians were a holy, godly people. He was thrilled with them. And so when he gets to the end of 2, here's what he says about how thrilled he was about their holiness. Notice 2.18. And I need to wrap up here. For we wanted to come to you, I, Paul, more than once, yet Satan hindered us. It's for another discussion. We can talk about that. And now look how he describes his people and his love for the people of Thessalonica with an elder's heart. For who is our hope? This is language that you'd think you'd say about Christ. Who is our hope? You'd say Christ is our hope. True. But for Paul, it's also what's hopeful to him is Christ is working in his people. Look at this. Who is our joy? Who is our crown? Now, if I just stopped there and you didn't read the rest, you'd say, Christ is my hope. Christ is my joy. Christ is my crown. True. But in an elder's heart, what also is his hope, joy, and crown is his people and their holiness and that they're presentable to Christ. Look at it. Who is our hope? Who is our joy? Who is our crown? Who, look at this. Crown of exaltation. Who is it the one that gives us reason to rejoice? Is it not you? What? An elder's heart is thrilled in his people's growth, his people's progress, his people's security, his people's holiness. Is it not you that are our joy? Is it not you that are our hope? Is it not you that are the letter written on our heart? And then look at where that hope, joy, and crown takes its, takes its shape. What arena in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming. Can you imagine the scene? Shepherd, sheep, Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus comes back and the shepherd says, here's my hope. These are my people. Here's my joy. Here's my people. Here's my crown. They're yours, Lord. I hope I cared for them well. My heart was for their growth and their holiness. And you're pleased with them. That is enough reason for my rejoicing. When God calls an elder and he puts in his heart an internal calling, whether he's a full-time guy or he's a, like we talked about, La- Laos elders. When he calls a man, he's putting in their heart that they would see their people more presentable to Christ as their joy, their crown of exaltation. So when we wrap up this study of the internal calling, I just want you to understand that when God calls elders, God makes elders with this internal burden to see his people holy, and it externally takes shape in their actions, and then the qualifications of their character are affirming all of that reality of what God's done in the heart. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time. I want to be sensitive to this precious group and this, this morning in your word. Please raise up more elders at Cornerstone Bible Church. Raise up more elders at Founders Baptist Church that have your heart for your people, which is their sanctification. In your name we pray. Amen.